All right. Well, hey, we, um, we're going to open the scriptures this morning. We're going to dive uh, into our altar series. And uh, we have a good friend uh, in the house this morning. His name's Jared Hurd. So I want to invite Jared up. Can we give Jared a big uh, round of applause as he comes? Here's what's so fun. Uh, me and this guy, we came on staff. Uh, I think you beat me, actually, um, a little bit, a little yeah, bit before know. here, probably some 15, 16 years ago. Um, we're yeah. a lot older than when um, <laughs> that started. I think we were both like in our in our late 20s. But um, Jared came on um, as an outbound under Mike Erie, if you know that name, and really sat in the teaching kind of role and seat being raised up. And um, I'm going to fast forward through his story. But he is now a lead pastor down in the San Diego area. His wife's here this morning. Uh, got to meet their three kids. It's like long surfer bro hair. Their kids was awesome, which this guy had really long hair too when he first got here, which was amazing. Yeah, so yeah. anyways, Jared, we are so grateful Good, to you. have you here. I want to pray over you. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to turn you loose. And so, awesome. um, Rock Harbor, would you just extend a hand, uh, in this direction? And, um, and so Jesus, we are so excited, uh, the Lord to have Jared here this morning and God, we thank you for your faithfulness in his life. God, we thank you for his family um, that was here. Lord, would you just bless them? Would you bless them? And God, as he opens the scriptures this morning, Lord, may it be his joy. And then Holy Spirit, would you fill his words? Would you literally spring out of the text? And would you leave us changed and transformed? And so, Lord, we bless Jared. We're so glad that he's here. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah. Thank you, Kit. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Rock Harbor. Good to be with you. As Kit mentioned, I came on staff here, I think it was 2007. Uh, it was my 10th birthday. And uh, I, Kit, you and I, we came on about the same time, and we both came on as outbound pastors, but I noticed only one of us left. Uh, I think it was a program just to keep who they liked, and uh, so congratulations on winning the sweepstakes, my friend. Uh, good to be with you. Uh, I uh, love Rock Harbor. I just want to start by saying that, and I know you do too. And I love this church. Uh, big reason why is because I met my wife in this church. Uh, true story. It was my first Sunday on staff. Um, I didn't even know if I could date her. I didn't know what the rules were. Uh, and true story, I had to go. I had two bosses at the time. Mike Gary was one and another guy named Don Williams. Anybody know who Don Williams is? Remember Don Williams? Uh, I went to a uh, staff meeting on Monday morning. and I said, guys, uh, here's the deal. Uh, you're the guys who hired the single teaching pastor, so it's kind of on you. Uh, but... I uh, met a girl and I said, am I allowed to ask her on a date? And uh, Mike said, no, true story. And he said, no. And Don said, Mike, you idiot. Where else do you want him to meet a girl? And uh, you want him hanging out at Applebee's at the bar? What do you, what do you want there? And Mike uh, and Don had like an argument for real. And Don, who was in his 70s at the time, we always just kind of went with what Don said. Don looked at me, true story, and said, you need to call her. That could be your wife. And here we are uh, today with our uh, three, uh, thank you. Um, uh, three boys, nine, seven, and five. Don't applaud yet because they're currently destroying your nursery. Uh, but we're so thrilled, uh, Roseanne and I, to be here today. And uh, I, I just believe this is true, that the best days for this community are in front of it. And just being here this morning, there's a spirit of expectancy. And I want to step into that in the series and alongside of you this morning. And I want to talk about prayer. Um, and we pray, uh, usually starting with uh, the phrase, our Heavenly Father, Father in Heaven. Jesus even taught his disciples to pray that way. Uh, our Father who art in heaven, and we close our prayer with this phrase, in Jesus' name. And I want to talk specifically about what those two phrases unlock for you and what they unlock for me. There's a power when we pray our Heavenly Father, and there's a power when we pray in Jesus' name. Before we get there, uh, it was a couple of months ago, my wife, uh, Rosanna, is a part of a fitness community in San Diego where we live called Forward Fitness. It's uh, uh, primarily a, uh, a female uh, member gym, and uh, which I just want to say this morning for free, uh, support your local businesses, your local gyms, your local restaurants. Can we all just agree to that? It's a tough time for everybody right now, especially uh, if you're here and you're a small business owner. Uh, but she's a part of that gym and she came home a few months ago and she said my gym primarily female gym uh, is doing a uh, a date night a couple's date night 
uh, would you be, be willing to, to come to the date night with me? And I said, uh, sure, honey. Uh, what, what are we going to do at the date night? She says, well, it's a, uh, we're going to uh, you know, do a workout together for about 45 minutes. And then after the workout, we'll have some hors d'oeuvres. And I said, well, uh, can you be a little more specific? What kind of workout are we going to be doing? And she said, uh, well, it's a functional movement class. How many of you ever heard of functional movement? And I learned two things. Uh, Rosanna and I have a very different idea of what constitutes a great date night. <laughs> and we also have very different ideas of what constitutes functional movement. Uh, but I agreed and uh, I, I go to this date night and uh, as I'm getting out of the car, she hands me a couple of two-pound weights. And how many of you guys have ever like, held the two-pound weights in a class? You're like, what is this? This is like, what? I I'm telling you, men and women, over the course of 45 minutes, those two-pound weights become torture devices. <laughs> and I did what any guy in this situation should do. I called a friend. Uh, I called my friend Cameron. I said, I need a little support. Uh, can you and your wife, Sydney, come to the date night with me? Because I don't know what I'm getting myself into. And so he obliged and he came. And we get there and Rosanna has staked out our place on the front row, uh, which if this is your first time to ever do a workout like this, you do not want to be on the front row. All my awkwardness was on display in that moment, like me and the instructor, like right here. Hi, how are you? And the, the workout starts and I quickly realize I have gotten myself into something. I don't know what I'm in for. And we're one move in, two moves in. I'm, I'm doing okay. And I'm watching all these dudes around the room, F45ers and CrossFitters, and they look like death just trying this stuff. And we started going through the workout. And at one point, I'm, I got like a, a two pound weight behind my leg and I'm kicking it up like this, like a dog peed on a hydrant. And <laughs> I, I, you know, and you just keep going and it's like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I can't feel my butt anymore. Just like <laughs> sweating bullets. And my friend Cameron, who was there, I looked down at him and he screams across the field at me. I have negative butt muscles, man. And he doesn't look like he's doing too well. And I scream back at him across the field. This is not functional movement. And we just sort of, uh, in that moment, just sort of stared at each other. Like, what have we gotten ourselves into? And I had to go to the hospital for about two weeks just to recover from that. That's a joke, by the way, in case you're wondering, like, oh, this guy's got issues. Uh, I, I say that this morning because I think a lot of the time when we become a Christian or you start going to church or you accept Christ in your life, uh, somebody says, well, you should pray. You should go to church. You should start reading the scriptures and so you start doing all the disciplines, right? You start praying, you start reading the Bible, and somewhere along the way you start going, this does not feel like functional movement. You have big problems in your life, job, health, finances. What do I do? How do I navigate this? And somebody says, well, you close your eyes and you talk to God who's not wearing skin and you're going, well, that does not feel like functional movement. And oftentimes if you're anything like me praying, it just feels like you're down here on planet earth, just trying. So like one, two, three, I don't know if this is going to work. And what I want to open up today is to see the prayer, the, the, the collective rhythm of prayer in our life, praying our father who art in heaven is this powerful functional movement in our life that in times builds a, a strength and a muscle and a muscle memory, and, and it gives you access to something that in the moment, it might just feel mundane or rote or, yeah, I've done this before. But in time, it's, there's a power to that. And when you pray, our Father who art in heaven, and when you pray in Jesus' name, you are unlocking a power and you're gaining access to something that you do not have access to on your own. And if you have a Bible, I want us to open it together to uh, Galatians chapter three. If you don't have a Bible, uh, I don't know, there's still yellow ones around. Ah, yes, that's awesome. I've got one, but uh, mine's, mine's actually fallen apart. I, have, I haven't changed it since I was on staff here 15 years ago. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, 
verse 26. I don't know what page it is. Anybody know what page it is in the yellow Bible? Is it still yellow? It is. It's the story of God Bible. That's awesome. If you don't have a, a Bible, you raise a hand and somebody will bring it to you. Awesome. Galatians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 26. How are we doing at 9 o'clock? You doing okay? Four of you. That's exciting. So great. I'm assuming online you're far more excited right now. You just snorted. I heard it. Yeah. That was awesome. They picked that up on the camera, and they're, somebody at home right now is going, rewinding it, going, did I just hear a snort? What was that? I'm sorry, I just called you out. Hopefully this isn't your first time here. <laughs> oh, you're with Buddy, right? Yeah. Buddy, yeah. Hey, Buddy, how are you? <laughs> what a great name. Okay, we're just reading the Bible today, I promise. Uh, so you're like, we've been here 10 minutes. We haven't opened a single verse. Okay, uh, verse uh, 26, and we're going to read through 4-7 because it's all part of the same piece for Paul. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, which, whoa, what is that about? And he's hearkening back to, to Genesis 12, a promise that was made that a people are going to be raised up and you'll be blessed to be a blessing to the world. And you and I are a part of that promise. And Paul is connecting the dots for the people 2,000 years ago to say this is all part of the same story from Genesis, but now it's through Christ that you're getting this promise and you're receiving it. Heirs according to the promise. And he keeps using this phrase, and you read it in Romans, you read it in Galatians, you read it in Ephesians, that we're heirs to something. What is that about? And then he says this, and this is the part that I want to spend some time really camped out on because it's so confusing at one level, but it's so beautiful when you open it up. He says, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is under age, huh, he is no uh, different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive, and here's the a powerful phrase, adoption to sonship. In fact, let's just all say that phrase together on the count of three. Adoption to sonship, one, two, three. Adoption to sonship. Adoption to sonship. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. Now on the surface, that has nothing to do with prayer, but I'm telling you, it has everything to do with prayer because he's telling you when you step into the presence of Jesus, when you hit bended knee, how you and I step into the presence of Jesus. And he's telling you, you step into the presence of God as an heir with Christ, a co-heir with Christ, and you have the inheritance of a child of a son of God. You uh, have heard somewhere along the way, even if you're not a Christian, well, you're a child of God or God's, you know, aren't we all kind of God's kids down here on planet earth? And what's the difference between me as a Christ follower praying and someone who's just trying it for the first time in the middle of a Chargers game, just throwing up a Hail Mary? What's the difference? Well, you were all God's kids in sort of a universal sense but you as a Christ follower are not just a child of God, you are an heir of God. There's a different kind of relationship there. Um, you, you, you have access to his valuables. Uh, he's, he's entrusting something to you. 
And you get this at a certain surface level. If I were to ask you to tell me your life story, for many of you, you would say, well, uh, my, my biological father is not really my father. I mean, he, he's not the one who raised me. You'd say, uh, you know, Jack, he, he's my biological father, but Frank, Frank is my, my real father because he's the one who, who raised me. He's the one who I, I got his values. He imparted his values to me. He, he, one day when he dies, he's going to impart his valuables to me. And that's who you are as a child of God. You, you pray in such a way that like, like a little child tugging on the arm of a father, you're an heir. You, you have the valuables and the values of your father in heaven. You're not just a, a generic, like we're all just one of God's kids down here on planet earth. And he says it this way in Romans, and I love this, Romans chapter 8, verse 17, he says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And that phrase right there, co-heirs with Christ, you have access to something, and this is the power of the gospel, not because you deserve it but because Christ has earned it on your behalf. And so when you pray, you step into the presence of God, not as uh, John who, you know, messed up all those times, not as uh, Tina, the, the twice divorcee, not as Jojo, the guy who spring break 1987 ruined his life. You, you don't step into prayer in that moment as you, you, you step into prayer as the co-heir with Christ. Saying, God, I have access to something, not because I deserve it, but because Jesus deserves it. And he's now family. He's now my brother. He's now, he's now the one that I enter into the presence of the Father through. So when you pray, Father, in Jesus' name, you're, you're naming who you are and you're naming what you have access to. Too. I'm a child of God and I have access through Christ to the valuables and the power and the resources of my Father in heaven, the creator of all things. And he, he says this in the next part. He says, I consider that our present, verse 18 of Romans 8, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. And so at one level... When you pray, there's a sense of expectancy about your future, that one day, uh, once and for all, on earth as it is in heaven, God's way, God's reign, God's rule is established in this world. No more pain, no more suffering, no more cancer, no more death, no more disease. And we pray in such a way, we know there's a future benefit. And so you pray with a sense of expectancy about something to come. And it would be as if you found out, uh, maybe you have a, uh, just imagine with me, uh, you have a, a rich uncle that you've never met, and you found out that uh, he was really sick, and when he died, you, you were going to get $100 million. And what, what would you do in that moment? You'd be like, well, uh, I hate to hear that he's, he, he's sick. How much money did you say? $100 million? <laughs> well, I hope he's okay. Well, uh, When's that $100 million coming my way? Uh, that you have power, you have access to something. And it's the same thing, that you would pray with a sense of expectancy that something good is coming in your direction. But with that, a co-heir with Christ, because what's the phrase used? You've been adopted. And that's a present reality. And so there's a present power that you have access to right now. Uh, if you're four years old and you are adopted by a wealthy man or woman, uh, what happens to you in that moment? It means you're wealthy instantly, not because you earned it, but because in that moment you now have a new father. You now have access to the valuables of that father. And so when you pray and you're down here on planet earth, it's not just, you know, function one, two, three, four, well, we're supposed to pray so we do this. Uh, no, you are, you are laying claim to who you are as a child of God, our Father, and you are laying claim to a future and a present benefit as the adopted sons and daughters of the loved, of, of the perfect Father. That's what you have. And so you step into that going, yeah, that's, that's mine. I'm a child of God, co-heir with Christ, and I'm stepping into his presence. And I love that phrase. He says, adopted to sonship, 
Adoption to sonship. That phrase appears, you've read that before over and over again in the New Testament. And some of you, you understand that because you were adopted into a family or you have adopted your sons and daughters and you, you, you get the power of that phrase that you have a new legal standing. You have a new identity. You get a new last name in that moment. I get this at a, at a small level. When I was in college, uh, both of my parents uh, got married uh, to other people. I should, I should add that. They're divorced. Um, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia originally. And both of my parents married uh, prominent Georgians, uh, prominent Atlantans. My mom got married when I was in college to uh, the president of the Georgia Golf Association at the time. Uh, his name is Mike Waldron, and uh, I grew up in a family as a kid. I did not know how to spell golf. Uh, you laugh, but I'm from Georgia. They don't teach you things like that there. And uh, one person also from Georgia, all right. Uh, and uh, I, all of a sudden, in college, I had access to something through Mike where I would go to the master's tournament and stand on the 18th hole. I'd watch him give speeches, and he's kind of a big deal in the golf world. And all of a sudden, not through my acumen or savviness, but through my relationship with Mike, I now had access to a power and a place that I never had access to before. And that's what it means as a child of God for you. Uh, my dad, when I was in college, married uh, the, the first black judge appointed to the bench in DeKalb County, Georgia. And uh, I'm not even quite sure in hindsight how he pulled this off. My brother and I are still shocked by it. Uh, but when he got married, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, my stepmom began to treat me uh, as if I was one of her kids. And I remember I was a, a college student at the University of Georgia, and I remember she came uh, right after they got married to a big uh, legal what-to-do banquet at the University of Georgia, and she invited me to come over to it. And I come walking in with my book bag, and, you know, I sit down at the banquet, and I'm making small talk with people who were there, and these are all big power players in the legal world. And, you know, I'm like, ooh, I'm a speech major, wow. And I'm talking to the guy next to me, and I'm like, so what do you do, man? And he's like, well... I'm the governor, and <laughs> I'm like, ooh, uh, which state? Uh, uh, this one, man. I'm like, oh, oh, cool. Uh, well, I, literally, the thing that popped out of my mouth was, well, thanks for signing my driver's license, bro. Uh, I don't know what to say right now. Uh, I didn't get invited to any more banquets, in case you're wondering. Uh, but in that moment, I was somewhere I did not belong, not because I earned it, but through the relationship with my stepmom, who to this very day still treats me like her child, like her heir. And Paul's saying, that's who you are as a child of God. You, step, you now have access to a power through the Spirit of God, through Christ's crucifixion on the cross, through the resurrection of Christ, a power is yours. You've been adopted as a, as a son, as a loved daughter of God. You did not have that before. That's not who you were before. But it's who you are in this moment when you stepped into the presence of Jesus. And that's for anybody, no matter what your background, economic standing and life is, you are adopted as a child of God. And when you pray, you come to the Father that way. I'm a co-heir with Christ, and I'm stepping into this moment. He digs into it a little more, and I love this. He says, uh, if you read through 26, or you read through 4, uh, 1, Galatians through 4, 7, he says, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, well, what is that about? He's no different from a slave although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So when we were under age, and this is getting weird, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father. So the spirit is praying for you and announcing who your father in heaven is 
even when you don't have words. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. This is the word of the Lord. That's who you are, an heir. And you've probably read over that before. You're like, well, what is that about? And especially this first phrase. Well, uh, what I'm saying is long, is as long as an heir is underage, what is this about? Like you can't buy cigarettes in the kingdom of God? What is that, what is that talking about? Well, Paul here is talking about two things that were a huge deal in the first century world, but I would argue they're still a big deal in our world. And it's how you receive identity and it's how you receive your inheritance. And in the first century world, these were enormous issues. Uh, They're still a big deal in our world, uh, but even more so then. And he's talking about for uh, underage sons and also for slaves Uh, how this idea of identity and inheritance would come into play. If you were a child in the first century world and you were under a particular age and your father was wealthy and had a lot of land, it did not matter. You, You did not have access to that until a set time that the father had established or until he died, you could, you didn't have access to his power, his authority. And for a slave, if you were in the house of your master It did not matter how hard you'd worked for him. It did not matter how kind he'd been to you. It didn't matter. You had no identity as a slave, and you also had no inheritance as a slave. Uh, When your time as a worker came to an end, it was over for you and for your lineage. And Paul here is is mixing the metaphor a little bit, and he's saying for, uh, for underage kids and for slaves, he says, now through Christ, it's, it's two groups of people that understand what it's like not to have access to power. Uh, Through Christ, the set time has come. Through Christ, you have received in Christ an identity and you have received your inheritance. You have access to that power adopted as sons, co-heirs with Christ. That power is yours now. So when you're on bended knee praying, you're not just down here on planet earth throwing up Hail Marys. You are down here on planet earth trying to clamor and claw to gain access to the power, the identity and the inheritance that God has said is yours as a child of God. And he uses this phrase here, redeem. And we've heard that phrase before. You kind of, you know, well, you can redeem a coupon. What is that about? Uh, redeem in the first century world was a very powerful idea. And it meant that the price had been paid in full for a slave. It was redeemed. It says, you have been redeemed. The price has been paid in full and you now have an identity. You now have an inheritance. You now have your father in heaven. And in Jesus name, you now have access to this new power in Christ. And so you step into that. Oh, that's mine. When I became a Christ follower, identity, inheritance, those are still big issues in our world, by the way. Identity and inheritance, we're a little more polite about it. We don't talk about it as much now. Uh, Maybe you do in your family, I don't know. Uh, But identity especially is a huge deal in our culture. If you, uh, in in most parts of uh, the world, in Eastern societies or throughout most of human history, uh, this is still true in many cultures, Eastern cultures today, how you gain an identity or how you gain your inheritance is you perform a role. Society says this is the expectation on you as a son, as an employee, and you perform your role. And if you perform your role well, you can gain your identity. You can gain your inheritance. You get what's entrusted to yours, but you deviate from that at all and you've lost it. And you know there's an enormous amount of shame in most traditional societies because I uh, stepped out of the flow of who everybody expected or wanted me to be. Uh, I've lost my identity. And there's an enormous crushing shame that comes with that. In a Western society like ours, it works the opposite. You uh, don't perform a role. You go inside of yourself and you decide who you are. And you go into the world and you tell the world, this is who I am. And you announce your identity. And so, consequently, uh, your identity in our society, it rises and falls with the car you drive, the job you have, and it's always in flux, your, your sense of worth. Roseanne and I, we use this phrase uh, in our house, I feel like I'm hustling for worthiness. Some of us, you get that. You constantly feel like you're hustling for worthiness in life, trying to, to gain that identity. And so consequently, it's why we live in the age of anxiety where everybody's anxious, everybody's stressed because there's this constant 
constant sense, if I don't get the promotion, if I don't get that, then my, my identity is, is fluctuating with that. And there's a crushing burden of anxiety in our culture. And what Paul is setting you free from, and you have to hang with this to see it, he's saying, in Christ, you don't have to wear the crushing burden of shame, and you don't have to wear the crushing burden of anxiety in your life, because through Christ as a co-heir, you have been given an identity and inheritance that you cannot lose. There's a power to that. And so you step into prayer all the time, again and again, I'm a co-heir with Christ. You step into uh, a a moment, uh, maybe it's just behind your steering wheel and you're stressed out on your way to work and you're not quite sure what's gonna happen when you get there. And you're just praying in that moment, not just, oh, you know, God, this is what we're supposed to do as Christians. No, I'm stepping into this moment as a co-heir with Christ. I'm stepping into this moment as a child of God and have access to a power as a child of God. And I don't know about for you, but for me, when I pray, I'm usually thinking about all the forces that are coming against me. You know what I mean? I'm thinking about the the people who are stressing me out, the things that are stressing me out, the money situation that's stressing me out, all the forces coming against me. And this flips the script where you'd begin to pray in such a way that you'd be thinking about the wind that's at your back. And when you pray, you'd be thinking about the power of God that's pressing and moving you forward through this life as a child, as an heir of God. And you've got enemies, you've got forces against you today. Uh, The writer even talks about that. He says, under the elemental spiritual forces of this world. But now you don't face those forces as like, ah, well, just one, two, three, four. Uh, No, you've got a power when you face those forces that are coming against you right now. You think about your biggest obstacle in life, you might feel like I am hopeless. It's over, I'm cooked, it's finished. And Paul's saying, "Uh uh-uh. You've got the wind of God, the power of God at your back moving into that situation right now with your daughter-in-law, moving into that situation right now at work. Moving into that financial crisis, you've got the power of God at your back as a child, as a co-heir with Christ. How many of us have ever heard of uh, uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear? It's a, any historians or history buffs here? Uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear. It was a war uh, between England and Spain in the 1730s. And uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear, uh, there was a, a, a British uh, naval captain named Robert Jenkins who was sailing one day off the coast of Florida. And a uh, Spanish uh, soldier, conquistador, boarded his ship and uh, cut his ear off, cut Jenkins' ear off. And he told him, instead of killing him, he said to Jenkins, he said, I want you to take your ear back to your king in England, and I want you to tell him, we're going to do this to the rest of England. We're, we're coming for you. This is the power we have as Spain. But you got to love the 1730s. <laughs> and he did. Jenkins goes back. I don't know how it worked, but he goes back to Parliament, and he's like, well, hey, uh, this happened to me. Uh, And Parliament and the King of England at the time in the 1730s went to war against Spain for nine years, all because they cut Jenkins' ear off. You got to love that. You went, you, you, I mean, how many people died? How many soldiers did you send into that nine year battle? How much money was spent uh, all over one ear? And essentially, what the king said was, you mess with one of us, you are getting all the resources of the crown coming in your direction. And I say that to you today because when you pray and you're going through something that you might go, well, that was like a small little flesh wound. That was a small little jab I took in life. And it feels so small, God probably doesn't even really care about it. God's looking at you going, no, 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 no. If somebody messes with you, they are getting all the resources of the crown coming down on them against them because you are my child and you are the co-heir with the son of God. And so consequently, 
not just you in that moment fighting against whatever you're fighting against, you are getting the, the wind of God, the resources of God at your back. They have messed with the crown, man. And all the resources of the kingdom of God are coming against your enemies and are coming against the things that are pressing against you right now. Not because you deserve it, but because Christ on your behalf has said you are a co-heir with me. So what is the weight right now? What is the thing? Like, I don't know if I can carry this. I don't know what to do about this. When I think about that, when I think about him, when I think about her, when I think about this health issue, when I think about this ongoing trauma or battle, I, I feel so helpless. And yeah, I pray about it and God's going, yeah, but do, do you know you, you are a child of God and a co-heir and the resources that are available to you right now? And when you pray, our Father, in Jesus' name, those two phrases right there are not just functional movement of prayer. They are unlocking the power of the crown and the kingdom of God on your behalf. And I love that he says that phrase, adoption to sonship. And if you go back in the verse a little bit, he says that you are his sons. Uh, God sent his spirit he says, but when the set time fully come, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman under the law to redeem those under the law. That was you and me, that we might receive this identity, adoption to sonship. And so when you pray, you're, you're praying as, as if you're Jesus in that moment. You're a co-heir. I have uh, three boys, as I mentioned earlier, Dane, uh, who's nine, Ezra, who's five, and Hayden, who's seven. And... Uh, my kids, a lot of you understand this, um, are, are a little too smart for their own good. Uh, sometimes I wish they weren't so, so smart. And uh, I, I say that because they're really good at manipulating me and one another. And my nine-year-old uh, has learned that if he asks for something too much, if he begs for something all day, uh, he can use up his asks. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you have little kids, you're like, yeah. And some of you have grandkids, you're like, yeah. They, they just like, they use up their ass. You finally have to tell them, hey, you can't ask for that anymore. So my, my nine-year-old might start the day at 7 a.m. Like, hey, can I have a Hot Wheel? Can I, can I you know, buy a, another Lego set or whatever? And by four o'clock, you're like, you can't ask for anything else. And so what I'll hear him do is he'll go into his brother's room, who's five. And he's kind of like the angel in our house because he hasn't learned to manipulate yet. And I'll hear Dane say to Ezra, our five-year-old, hey, here's what I need you to do. Uh, I've used up all my ass today. <laughs> so I need you to go in there. And here's the list, bro. I need you to ask for Lego set. I need you to ask for a Hot Wheel. I need you to ask for this. Hey, you know what he's doing in that moment? He's saying, Ezra, I don't want you to go ask in my name. I want you to go ask in the beautiful name of Ezra, and what happens? Nine times out of 10, he gets the Hot Wheel or whatever it is he's asking for. Uh, but in that moment, he's not asking in his name. He's asking in the name of his brother. And he's saying, Ezra, it's not because I deserve it. It's because you're five and adorable and you deserve it. So you go ask. And Jesus is saying in this moment, in Galatians, Paul is saying the same thing. You do not come to the Father and ask for things in your name because you deserve it. You come and you ask in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, because he deserves it. And he earned the full rights as the Son of God. And for you on your behalf, you now have the full rights as a son and a daughter of God. And you step in in that moment in prayer and you say, not because I deserve it, but because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, deserves it. What happens at the cross? Christ crucified, crying out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment, he is being stripped of his sonship. Jesus Christ at the cross lost his sonship so that you could gain your sonship and your daughtership as a child of God. 
He lost his identity so you could gain your identity. He earned the full rights, lived a perfect, blameless life. He earned the full status as a child of God. All the benefits of the property and the valuables of his father in heaven uh, were owed to him as as a perfect child. And on the cross, he stripped of his sonship so that you could gain your sonship and you could gain your identity as a child of God. And so when you pray, our Father, in Jesus' name, when you pray, our Father, you're praying, I know who I am. I'm a child of God. And when you pray in Jesus' name, you're saying, I know what I have access to, not because I deserve it, but because Jesus Christ has earned it on my behalf. I want to create some space for you right now. What is the thing? Maybe you're not even a Christ follower, but you've thought about praying because life is crushing you right now. What is the thing in your life financial? What is the thing in your life right now? Maybe it's a son or daughter who's far from God. What is the thing? You're like, I don't know what to do. In my own power, I'm helpless. And maybe we just take a moment here for you to pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. For you to cry out as a child of God. And maybe you've prayed before, but it's always felt a little bit like functional movement, and I'm just supposed to do this. But in this moment, you'd step in as the full son, daughter of God, and say, as a co-heir with Christ, I'm trying to gain access to something. I'm asking for the resources of the kingdom of God to be leveraged on my behalf, Father, because I don't know what to do. And he says, you are a co-heir with Christ, our Father, in Jesus' name. Our Father, in Jesus' name. I pray you'd never use those phrases the same way again. They unlock a power for you as a child of God. Just a moment, Caleb and the band are going to lead us in worship. But before we do, let's just take a moment. Singers love to sing and preachers love to preach, but God needs room all by himself. And maybe in this moment, you just want to pray in the stillness and quietness of your seat. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. I want to give you some space and then you just pray to God out loud, quietly, however you want to pray. And then I'll come back and pray over you. Father, every single one of us in this room, whether we know it or not, is so desperate for you, so desperate for the power that you offer us as your sons and as your daughters. God, some of us come through the fire of the last 18 months and we smell like smoke right now because we've been burned, our eyebrows have been singed and we're battle tested and battle weary, so exhausted from the constant change of culture and business and our families. And we're here in this moment saying, Father, my heart is weary. God, some of us in this moment, the moment I said, you know what you need to pray for, somebody's eyes welted up with tears because they're thinking of their daughter who's far from you. And in this moment, they're crying out, Father, 
I don't know where, I don't know how. I just pray by the power of God, you'd reach her in this moment. And may this prayer be a seed that drops into her heart and spirit of God, would you water that seed? Father, somebody in this moment, God, in their joblessness is praying and begging, is there a breakthrough coming? Because I'm tired and I'm exhausted. And I pray in this moment in Jesus' name and the power of God, would they experience a breakthrough in their heart as a co-heir with Christ, not because they deserve it, but because you have earned it on their behalf. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for somebody within the sound of my voice who has been so beaten down by life and they're not quite sure how to hold their head up in this moment. And I pray Father, in Jesus' name, would they gain access to a power that they have never experienced? And would they walk out of this place today? Maybe they came in with their head hanging low, but would they walk out of here with their hands raised high, exclaiming and proclaiming to the world, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I have access to something today. God, all of us in this room who have stepped into the presence of Jesus, we are not just your kids, we are your heirs. There's a power that we have today. And I pray we live in the fullness of that. Praying in Father, in Jesus' name, Father, in Jesus' name. Unlocking the mysteries of heaven. I want that. And I know these men and women want that too. It's with a sense of expectancy, not anxiety. That we come to you today, Father. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's children said, amen. Grace and peace, my brothers and sisters.